We're continuing our partnership with Learn Liberty this week, and joining me is a TV and radio journalist, host of two hugely successful podcasts, Common Sense and Hardcore History, and a self-described political Martian. Dan Carlin, welcome to the Rubin Report. Thank you for having me on. Political Martian, I love this phrase. I understand why you use this phrase, but tell the people who don't know what a political Martian is. What is it? It came from not being able to have a good, easy description when people ask you your political views. I'm really jealous of the people that can throw a word out there and everybody goes, okay, I get where you're from. <laughs> and I didn't have anything like that. And so I tried to figure out how you, in a very nice short way, describe that you're kind of off the map. And that was what I came up with, just this idea that, listen, I'm from Mars. As far as you're concerned, uh, because no word. I mean, I, I would have to sit there and go, well, I'm a little bit this, and then you, you start to give them sort of a political recipe, 30% this, 20%, and just political Martian ends up, people can nod their head and say, okay, I get it, you're off the grid somehow. Yeah, and some of it is also that you're actively trying to, to figure out things still, right? Like, we have this thing in America where everyone seems to believe or want everyone else to believe that they know everything. You, you don't come from that position. Well, it's a combination of that and, and, and believing that you have, and this is not, you know, uh, I'm not insulting, I hope, people who have ideologies, but this idea that you could have a template that works all the time is something that just doesn't appeal to me because I think you have to be able to pivot based on circumstances. You have to be able to, to admit that something's not working, but if that conflicts with your ideology, how do you reconcile those things? You have to be able to learn based on what you're actually seeing and I felt like there's not a whole lot of flexibility sometimes in these ideologies. Yeah, what percentage of people do you think actually understand political ideologies in general? That's what I was sort of talking about at the top of the show. That it's like, I feel like people don't really understand what really is the difference between a liberal and a progressive or a libertarian and a conservative or any of that stuff. Like, do you think most people, even that talk about politics professionally, actually understand sort of the, the philosophic uh, underpinnings of this stuff? Well, the easy answer to that is no, but the second answer is partly because those words have all changed in terms of meaning. I mean, take, take, take liberal as a perfect example. Uh, I think I'm a liberal. I think you're a liberal. I think most people in this country who favor uh, a democratic form of government based on freedom and rights and civic action and all that, that we're all liberals in the grand scheme of things. Um, you know, you have to kind of sit down with people and, and dive deeply into what they believe to try to figure out you know, where they stand. But, but on the spectrum of governments all around the world throughout all time periods, we're all liberals, right? right? So we're just arguing over you know, what percentage of this or that you wanna, you wanna put into the category. But so by, by not knowing what the words really mean or by conflating what they mean or changing what they mean, I think the reason people use progressive is because liberal's been so changed in mm -hmm. terms of its meaning. I don't think any of these terms. What does conservative mean? I mean, I'm fiscally conservative. What does that mean? Right. It you just know. doesn't mean anything anymore. No. I mean, that, as, I, as I've done this show, at least in this car incarnation for the last two years, I've realized I use these labels because sometimes you need them to frame conversations, and yet the more we use them, the more meaningless they become, which is a strange... I guess I'm a political Martian. Well, and, and the thing is, is, that, is that if you sit down and try to figure out when you're talking to people, um, where do you stand on this issue or where do you stand on that issue? I, I always feel like we're all a mix and that, that if you think you're really up and down the line, give me a little time and I'll, okay. I'll figure out. I always say we're all radical on something. You know, I'll find some subject where, you know, if you said that you felt that way about it and gave no sort of clarifying remark, people would be like, whoa. But, we're, <laughs> but we're, I, think, I think that that describes all of us. I think we feel like we have to, you know, I remember learning about totems and like psychology 101. And I think that's what a lot of people do, where they sit there and say, part of my self-image is that I'm a conservative or that I'm a liberal. And that locks you into things. I mean, to be able to say that I base my opinion on my own views and that I don't have to fit into any particular box, I find that completely liberating. I mean, people will say that you're inconsistent. That's where they'll throw, well, you're really not consistent. You don't have a consistent philosophy. Yeah. I'm not sure why I have to have a consistent philosophy. Right, why should we treat a political philosophy like a religion? That's actually the reverse of how we should treat it. And well, yet that, they seem to want this purity test. And what's all that the great time. line? I mean, uh, I love that line, and I think it was, um, who was it who said it? I think it may have been uh, 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 Keynes who said, you know, that somebody accused him of flip flopping, essentially. We would call it flip flopping today. Yeah. And he said, when the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do? 
<laughs> you know, uh, and that's kind of how I feel. I mean, I'm not going to get locked into, I, I know that I tend to be in my own life certain ways, mm -hmm. but if I'm a fiscal conservative, for example, which I am, and you find out that for this particular cause, you need to spend a lot of money, if I determine the cause is worth it, I'm going to spend a lot of money. Does that mean I'm a flip-flopper? Right. You know, so, I mean, in that sense, I guess I'm more of a pragmatist, but, but even a pragmatist can be utopian in ways. You could say, okay, I want to base things on what's likely to work, at the same time, I want to shoot for better than we have now. Does that make you a pragmatic utopianist? I mean, do those words, and, and, and once you start to mix those phrases, do they mean anything anymore? Yeah. Uh, I'm a liberal conservative. I'm a, I'm, I'm a conservative liberal. I'm a pragmatic utopianist. What are these words? <laughs> That's you know, a lot of stuff. Uh, I like premeditated spontaneity. I mean, you know, at what point does, does it not make any sense anymore? Yeah. How frustrating does some of that get for you as someone that tries to bring some of these ideas up, that you have to talk about things sort of in a way that sometimes can be a little, uh, you know, confusing even for you? It was frustrating in traditional media because they, yeah. they demanded yeah. that I do that, which is why it was, you know, I was always fighting with people. And the, uh, in, in the world that we're in now, in new media, it's not frustrating at all. I can be anywhere I want, which is why I'm a political Martian, and no one says anything. They're fine with it, which is, you know, to me, that's a sign of the changing maybe uh, state of things, although it also might be a sign that I don't have a lot of liberal or conservative listeners. Yeah. I don't, you know, it could be one or the other. I have a lot of political Martians listening. Yeah, I think it's probably a little bit a of both, bit of I both. suppose. Yeah. Uh, tell me a little bit about your uh, time in the more mainstream media and what led you to say, I'm going to go off the range here and see if I can figure this out on my own, which you've obviously been very successful I at. never wanted to do that. I, didn't, I, didn't, um, I was uh, working here in town at, at the ABC station and uh, I was working on the assignment desk, and I thought, you know, I was about 23, and I thought I had it made. I thought this was really good. And these reporters would come in who were only a little bit older than I was and said, what are you doing to get out of here? And I said, nothing. I'm <laughs> loving this. This is great. And they said, oh, no, you'll die here. You know, you'll be doing this forever. Um, and so to sort of assuage them, uh, I sent out tapes to be a reporter, and no one was getting hired, so I didn't think there was any real danger. And then I got hired. Um, and I became a television reporter, and then, as life has it, you know, opportunities intervene, and then someone gave me a talk radio show job, and I was doing three hours a day, five days a week, and that's where I think things really started to grow and change, because, you know, um, and I, I'm always, uh, always feel bad for the people that are getting started today, because I got to make all my egregious mistakes <laughs> and have all that stuff go out into the ether and be gone. If I started today, those would all be some YouTube video all put together, and they'd see every gaff and horrible thing I ever said or made. Yeah, that shouldn't be understated, right, what you're saying oh, no. right there, because I think that's a huge thing, and I mentioned that I had Dennis Prager on a few weeks ago, and I said to him, you know, now that you're in the digital world, you come from traditional media and, and radio, but how conscious are you of being afraid of saying something that can just be selectively edited or clipped in a way that's gonna make you seem like you said the reverse thing and then just be relentlessly attacked for that? And it, the fact that you were able to have the breeding ground before it was fully on the, the, the uh, I guess, the infinity grid of existing forever, it's I pretty sweet. I call it sweet. digital stone. It's a digital yeah. stone. As long as there is this thing, those things will be out there now now that I'm, now that I've got most, I hope, of the egregious mistakes out of the way, um, I like that it's digital stuff. Yeah. I mean, I like the idea that it's never going away. But it, but the kids coming up today who have to make all their mistakes, and have it be forever available, I'm I'm sympathetic. I'm glad I didn't exist in that era. I'm glad I was able to get all of my nonsense out of the way um, before it was forever. But yeah, I mean, that, so in terms of my career, that's how you learn, and and um, and and then also. The political Martian thing works itself out that way too, because in talk radio when I was there, as I think it still is, it's really a conservative medium, mm -hmm. and you know you would have a conservative guy, then you'd have me, and then you'd have another conservative guy, and I was the one who was continually, I mean, I was at odds with the audience all the time, and I was about 26, and the average age of talk radio was about 35 to 45, and so I mean, I it was. Um, it was a baptism by fire that, looking back on it now, was really good for me at the time. It was really hard, but I mean, that's how life is for everybody. I mean, you, you know, as you're working your career out, you have these ages where you're just pulling your hair out sometimes, and now you look back on it and it's a wonderful learning experience. At the time, not knowing the future, you right. know, it's, uh, as I think, especially for guys in your 20s, when you really are in a place where you want to, you know, uh, your self-image is so wrapped up in how you, and Gosh, it was such a hard time period. And now I look back on it and think, though, if you don't go through that, you're not where you are now. And so um, 
you know, when you give your kids advice as a parent, there's going to be a lot of that I'm going to throw at them and hope it sticks. Yeah, of course, they're going to have that uh, digital, what do you call it? The digital, digital stone. The digital stone. Their, their stuff's going to all be uh, etched in digital stone. Yeah, and they also put their hand want it to and be talk to the hand. They don't want to hear anything <laughs> dad has to say anyway, so I'm not sure you can teach your kids a lot sometimes. Yeah, I'm curious. So you're the, you were the sort of liberal or Martian, Martian even around then. a lot of conservative radio. What do you think it is about conservatives that it's only conservatives that listen to radio, basically. I mean, we know that liberal channels, Air America and any of the progressive stuff, yeah, I guess some of it exists here or there, but it pretty much always fails or nobody listens. Is there something about conservatives and talk, do you think? It's a good question. And first of all, I always had a libertarian bent, which allowed me a place where there could be a meeting of the minds between the audience. If you talk about freedom and liberty in the Constitution, which I do, um, there was a place where we could have some commonalities and then work around it. Uh, in terms of liberal, it's because I believe in things like social programs and things like that. So there were areas where where we could have a little uh, a little friendly competition, but but there were meeting of the minds areas. In terms of why, um, you know, Rush Limbaugh, he always likes to say that there will be a wing of the talk radio history library, and he's right, and he will own that. But by but by changing the landscape, you know. I can't speak for other mediums. I can definitely talk about radio. It's sure. not extremely inventive. And they're not extremely chance takers. You know, they do. And so when you see something works, and I think Limbaugh actually said this. He said, for years they told me to be like someone else and not to do this. And then the minute he makes it, <laughs> then, the, then they just want you to be like him. Yeah. I think that was partly my problem too. When I would go in there and say, why do you want me to be like all these other people? They would say, because that's what works. Look at what's working everywhere. So I think there's this attitude now, look, I guess what I'm saying is if a liberal talk show host made it big somewhere, then you would see everybody saying, well, listen, this is working in Boston. You should try, you know. So I think there's a tendency to follow the leader in that business. And I think he started off the trend after the Fairness Doctrine ended. I mean, if you go listen to talk radio before Limbaugh, it's a completely different animal. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember listening to it as a kid, and it's a, it, it doesn't bear any resemblance to what we have today. So once you see that working, that becomes the template, and if you want to be big, you need to do it that way. So that's why I had such a hard time for 12 years in the medium, because yeah. I wasn't like that. Do you remember a guy by the name of Bob Grant? Who used sure. To be a big radio sure. guy? I remember being in the car with my mom when I was 12, 13, something like that. My mom hated this guy, did not ever agree with him on anything. His callers would call in, he would just scream at them, and then they'd hang up. And it was, it was just chaos. And I remember thinking at the time, who could listen to this kind of chaos? And yet he was one of the biggest guys it around. It goes back to a guy named Joe Pine, who was the original. And there was a lot of imitators, but Joe Pine was, I want to say, you know, you go back to like 1970, and Pine actually had a, a TV show too, and it was the first one where you would just, because before that it was like the Dick Cavitts and everybody, you know, and the William F. Buckleys, and there were cigarettes and black and white and high-minded, and Joe Pine would just say, you know, yeah. you're a communist, and you yell <laughs> at him. And, and, you know, what's funny is, is that when these are novelties, it's interesting. Yeah. But when it becomes the norm, it, it, I mean, I was, I was talking to somebody the other day and we were talking about what I heard a, a right-wing talk show host say the other day. And I know he doesn't believe that. Yeah. But he's got to differentiate himself from the competition. So, for example, they were talking about a riot in Berkeley and it was who could be the hardest on the rioters. And this guy said they ought to be taken out by the police, put in a back room and euthanized like animals. And you go... Well, why would he say that? Well, he says that because he's got to right. differentiate himself from the competition. Who said the toughest thing? I mean, this guy is going to go vacation at his house in the Hamptons after he said this. Meanwhile, he's ginned up the anger level in the country so much more. Now, now there's not a lot of individual responsibility because no individual is responsible for all of that. Sure. But collectively, it's creating a situation where there's no countervailing forces. I mean, if you're ginning up the anger on this side, What's reducing the anger on that side? What, what's helping us achieve some sort of stasis? And the answer is nothing. Yeah. Well, so, I think the answer might be, maybe if I could be so bold, it would be a little bit of people like us. People that like us who are a little out of the system, right? We're out of the mainstream system, but we're trying to find some answers. So you get the, the flamethrowers saying crazy things like that. I, I was you know, talking about the protesters myself, but I'm certainly not for euthanizing them. But that people like us who actually try to explore some of these ideas are maybe the counterbalance now. So think, I guess some of that exists. Do you think exists. the same people are listening? No, that, and that's an inherent problem, I guess. But I think we're getting some of them, right? Because We know this because the, the cable news and mainstream news, their numbers keep going down and digital stuff keeps rising. So we must be shifting 
some of those people over, right? I could suggest that maybe it's a genre playing itself out. You know, that's the other problem. Is so that, it's in the death throes. Basically. Yeah, and I think what happens is naturally you take it more and more extreme, right? Because when you're not, it's, it's a little like a, a drug situation where you need more and more to get the same effect. But at a certain point, you overdose and die, right? No matter how strong you are. And I yeah. think when you're talking about euthanizing protesters in the back room, there's not much further you can go. Right. And so <laughs> may, maybe what happens at that point is the genre and the medium and the style plays out, and it's cyclical. I mean, I think you could say that, again, like, like cutting off your heroin supply for a while and going back, I mean, it may come back another round, but I'm not sure what these people can do to continually gin up the level of anger so that those people are still getting something out of the program. I mean, I find this in my own political show where after a while you think, at least I think, it's getting repetitive. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you do? I mean, if you've already said everything that you think, and I'm not willing to say stuff I don't believe, I'm not willing right. to, to take it to the next level to keep the heroin hit you know, affecting you the way you want it to, um, at what point do you say, okay, I've said everything I could say, um, you either take this or leave it, but I'm not going to continue to hammer this point home. I don't need to. I'll do something else. Yeah. I'm not sure everyone has that freedom, and I know that those people are being told by consultants on these talk stations, more, heavier, heat, heat, heat. Um, so what do you do in, in those moments where you've felt, I've said this already, this, I've made this case, I've talked about this for a couple months or maybe a couple of years, and you want to shift, how do you actually, do you tell your audience, all right guys? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Oh, yeah we're, we're going. Good. I've always been very, I've always been very open with them yeah. about my struggles, but partly is you try to find different ways to, to look at the point from different angles. I mean, that's what I think. You know, media, with, with radio especially, they used to say that because people are getting in and out of their cars, for example, all the time, you can't go any deeper than 15 minutes. Right. Because otherwise, you know, you can't assume that people are following you through this whole broadcast. I mean, they used to say, I, they have to know where you stand on every single issue within five minutes of turning on the radio. <laughs> that's a, a cartoon nightmare. character, by yeah. the way. Yeah, it's a cartoon. Yeah. So I said to them that that's not going to happen. Now, on, on my program and on your program, you can show shades of gray and nuance, and especially because that's actually novel now. Now, that might play out the same way that the right-wing stuff is playing out. Right. But, but the novelty of being able to say everything is a little bit more complex than you make it out to be is great. But I've done more than 300 common sense shows, and I start running. I'm not creative enough to continually come out with new ways to do that, at least not to my satisfaction. The audience says they still want to hear more of this stuff. But I'm not sure I want to give it to them. That to me seems too much like what I got away from. Um, you so know, this, is, this is the true artist struggle. I don't know if you think about it in, that, in those terms, but really this is the struggle of an artist to create something successful you're exactly and, then, right. and then still feel enough inner power to continue and not pander and well, you're, make you're, something new and all it, that. It shows you've really thought about it because it's exactly right and it's something that I didn't get initially. I had to, I had to learn it by slowly but surely. First of all, Getting used to the idea that anything you're doing is art is weird because you can't call yourself an artist Artist <laughs> is something that the, that the the other people have to say yeah, and and first of all I don't think that anything that we do politically is art I, And that's part of the problem because now the other podcast that I'm doing has evolved into something that is a little a little bit like art anyway, yeah. and it's so satisfying to be able to do something where you stand back and you look at it and you go I'd like my grandchildren to hear that because if I die before they meet me, they'll get a chance to know me through this. Whereas the more I listen to the political stuff, even my own stuff, um, there's I don't see any art in it. And, mm -hmm. and, and once you've done some painting, if you will, the idea of going and doing my pool cleaning job is just not as, as, not as um, satisfying. And, and at a certain point, I'm tired of it. I mean, yeah. I, I think... We live in a country that's a representative democracy, which requires us to be engaged. Um, but you, because of what you do, are hyper-engaged. I'm hyper-engaged. At a certain point, and this is why I didn't do 12 straight years of talk radio, because you burn out. And especially in my case, and you and I talked about this earlier, I mean, I'm a guy who feels like I rubbed the magic lamp and the genie came out and said, you have a wish, what is it? I said, I want a political outsider because these politicians are killing us. And he gave me Donald Trump, and I thought, <laughs> whoa, I really should have had a lawyer with me to decide exactly how I wanted to phrase that wish. Right. Um, and, but what that does in my particular case is I'm not sure what to do anymore because I got what I asked for for, I've been doing this 24, 25 years if you had my radio thing. 
I never thought I'd get a political outsider. Now I have one, and look what I got. So what do I tell my audience now? Where do I go from here?